Would you all stand with us, church family? Let's sing together. Welcome to Faith Community Church's uh, Christmas Eve service. If you are um, not familiar with our services here, because we're in the worship center and we're only six feet apart, we do require that you would wear a mask if you're able to um, while there is singing. Once I start talking and preaching, you can take it off because usually you don't talk back to me. You might, but usually you don't. So that's our mask policy for this service. When we have a service in the gym, you do not need to have a mask when we sing uh, because the rows are 10 feet apart. But that's neither here nor there. Come this Sunday. If you want to come to a singing without a mask, come to our 8.30 service in the gym. 10.30 service would be here. Again, welcome to uh, Faith Community Church. If you're watching online, we're glad you're watching also, and we uh, welcome you to uh, our Christmas Eve service. We celebrate Christmas Eve because this is the time that uh, we recognize God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his only begotten son. He sent Jesus Christ. He came as a baby. He lived as a, a boy and a man and without sin so that one day he would go to a cross to pay for our sins. It's all about God's gift to us. We have a gift as a church to give you. We encourage you to read through God's word. And we have these little calendars. They're on the tables as you leave or you can find them on the information table. Um, they're calendars. They give you Bible readings, suggestion readings every day. If you do read them every day, you'll read through the whole Bible uh, one time, the New Testament twice, and the book of Psalms twice, and Proverbs 12 times. So if you would like this, this is free for you to go. If you don't want to read through God's Word, there's still a calendar for you to mark in your grocery day and all that kind of stuff. So we have this for you on your way out. We're here because of the fact that God loves us. And we want to keep Christmas a focal point vertical, meaning on God and on His Son, Jesus Christ, and the reason why He came. So all the singing that we're going to do, looking into God's word that we're going to do, having a communion of service where we recognize the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and how we identify with him through that, uh, that's all part of giving glory to Jesus Christ. And we're glad that you're here tonight to worship Jesus along with us. So if you're able, now stay seated, let me pray, and then you can stand to sing again. Lord, we come before you thanking you so much for your, your love for us. Scriptures say uh, you demonstrated your love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ Jesus came to die for us. We thank you that we celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. But really, without the, the death, burial, and resurrection, the birth doesn't mean very much. We thank you that he conquered the grave, that he lives at the right hand today of the Father, and that he intercedes on behalf of his children. 
But most of all, we thank you that he's our Savior. He's our Lord. He's the one that we truly want to worship this evening. And it's in his name I pray. Amen. Amen. And as Bob, and as Bob said, let's all stand together and continue to sing.
sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Would you pray with me, church? King Jesus, as that song says, that is what we are here to do tonight. God, we are here to give you the glory that you deserve. God, and just we are so grateful. God, just we are so grateful for your coming. God, just you being a God that values being with your people, that you are truly a God with us. And yeah, yeah, that you are Emmanuel. God, and just we thank you so much for that gift. And just keep us focused on that gift yeah, tonight and tomorrow, and not just just this kiss, and not just through this Christmas season, Jesus, but just as we continue to move into the beginning of this next year and as the rest of our lives, just keep us focused on that. That you truly are a God that values being with your people, and that you love us so much more than we can begin to comprehend or imagine. But we love you and we praise you, and it's in your mighty name we pray. Amen. Y'all can go ahead and have a seat. Many of you know that I have three sons who are all married, and now we have, well, ten grandchildren with two more on the way, so that'll make an even dozen. I'm wondering which one of my sons will give us a baker's dozen, but uh, I don't know. Cheryl says that's not going to happen, probably. Anyway, Christmas, we love to get the whole family together, but because of COVID, it's really changed things around. You just can't get all the family together at this Christmas. Maybe you are, but um, we're not being able to do that. Uh, but every time we do have a Christmas time with our, our grandsons and granddaughters and sons and daughter-in-laws, we always read uh, Luke 2, which is what we call the Christmas story before we plunge under the tree to get packages. And in Luke chapter 2, you know the story about Caesar Augustus and the taxation that's coming and Mary and Joseph leaving from Nazareth to go down to Bethlehem. And when they were there in verse 7 of chapter 2, it says she gave birth to her firstborn son and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And then in the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And then an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they, the shepherds, were terribly frightened. But listen to the words of the angel of the Lord. Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ, or Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. I titled this short talk, Peace on Earth. Peace on Earth. Erwin Lutzer who was pastor of Moody Church in Chicago for many years, now he's the pastor emeritus, he wrote a little arg article in this Decision magazine, this is the Billy Graham Evangelical Association magazine called Decision, and his article says, peace on earth, really? Really? And so I read this and I said, I want to talk about peace on earth as well. But here's what Lutzer said. The promise, peace on earth, sounds like mockery. The year 2020 will not go down in history as peaceful. Given the worldwide pandemic, lawlessness in the streets, racial conflict, and ongoing political wrangling, whether in the United States or in other countries of the world, peace is the exception, not the rule. 
How does the promise apply to a family who has lost a loved one to COVID-19? Or a homeless teenager? Or a heartbroken parent? Peace is a gift we would all like to have, but it seems as if the world has been left to manage as best it can without it. So did Jesus bring peace to the world, or did he not? Did Jesus bring peace, or did he not? And for a few moments, I'd like us to focus on this question. Did Jesus bring peace to the world, or did he not? We just sang, hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. What's the next line? Peace on earth. Okay. Did he bring peace? Well, from the scriptures, I want to bring out two things relating peace and Jesus. First, Jesus came to bring man into a peace relationship with God. The reason why he came is to bring mankind into a peace relationship with God. Because of sin, man has been and is alienated from a holy God. Each one of us has sinned. Sin entered the world, according to Genesis chapter 3, at the very beginning with Adam and Eve. And once they sinned, mankind has been alienated from God. Sin has made a separation between us, you and me, and a holy God. And Christ Jesus came for the purpose of dying so that he might bring us into a peace relationship with God. Here's a set of verses in Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 through 22. For it was the Father's good pleasure. Now the Father is the Lord God, God the Father. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. The him is Jesus. And through him, through Jesus, to reconcile all things to himself. Back to the Father. Now how many know what the word reconcile means? Okay, put all those hands down. (laughs) When we use reconcile, we use it like a, I got a bank statement from the State Bank of Davis. Every month, I get a checking account statement. And I go through the process of trying to reconcile my checkbook with what they wrote and printed up in that bank statement. Reconcile means you bring it into a harmony, bring it into a peace relationship. Now, whenever my check-in book, my checkbook doesn't match the bank, I call the bank and say, you made a mistake. No, I don't do that. I go back through every one of my figures to figure out where did I make the mistake? Why is my checkbook wrong? And by the way, I'm not at peace when that checkbook is wrong. So I'm not in a peace relationship with the bank until I get it reconciled. And once I get it reconciled, then everything is peaceful in my house again. Reconcile means to bring into a peace relationship. So going back to the verse... Through Jesus to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, meaning the cross of Jesus. And through him, I say, were the things on earth, were things in heaven. And although you, this is you and me, we were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he, yet Jesus, has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him, the Father, holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Paul writes it very complexly, but what he's trying to simply say is that we are alienated from God because of sin. We're hostile in mind, we're engaged in evil deeds, meaning we're doing what we want to do, not so much what God wants us to do. And because we're hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, alienated from God, God sent his son to go to a cross so that we could be in a peace relationship with God. And the mechanism that brings us into a peace relationship with God is faith. Faith. When you place your faith in Jesus as Savior, it enables you to have peace with God. In Romans chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Therefore... Having been justified or declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We are declared righteous by faith in Jesus. God now sees you when you put your faith in in his son, Jesus Christ, God sees you as righteous because he sees Jesus in you. Not because you're righteous, you're not righteous, but Jesus is righteous 
And when you by faith come to Jesus, God gives you his righteousness. Isn't that a good deal? You can have peace with God by putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Did Jesus bring peace to the world or did he not? Well, Jesus came to bring us into a peace relationship with God. Secondly, Jesus himself says that he came to give his followers his peace or give us inner peace. In John 14, 27, Jesus says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled nor let it be fearful. Even in a world where there's much tribulation and distress, we can have inner peace. We can have Jesus' peace when we come to faith in Christ. In the past, I've talked uh, much about persecution that goes on around the world. Voice of the Martyr sends me a little pamphlet every month, the magazine, but this was a special report. It deals with India. Christians are not welcome as India moves to, toward Hindustan. That's a new word. Hindustan. Since being re-elected as India's prime minister last year, Narendra Modi has kept his campaign promises. And that has meant more suffering and persecution for our Indian brothers and sisters in Christ. Church meetings are routinely targeted. Pastors are violently attacked. And India's leaders and laws increasingly recognize only Hindus as rightful citizens. Still, Christians in India understand that Jesus' call to go and make disciples is independent of any government's approval. And Hindu nationalists understand that one of the biggest threats to their, well, Hindu ideology is the gospel of Jesus Christ, which frees Hindus from the bondage of trying to appease the millions of gods that they have. If the gospel continues to spread, India cannot become the land of the Hindus. In Hindustan, therefore, Christians must be treated as enemies. Our Indian brothers and sisters in Christ accept their treatment as hostiles for representing Jesus and spreading the gospel. And their faithful sacrifices prove to the government that they are not the only ones willing to dedicate their entire lifetime to a cause. Here's a man, Kandi Mudu, a 27-year-old man from the Jharkhand state, was a Hindu before coming to know Jesus Christ in 2018. But after coming to faith, he immediately began an enthusiastic, he became an enthusiastic evangelist and soon led his three brothers to Jesus Christ. When village elders demanded that he abandon his Christian faith, he refused. And when he was pressured to join village festivals intended to earn the approval and protection of the Hindu gods, Kande again refused. Seeing that their threats could not change his heart, local Hindu radicals resorted to violence. The first time they attacked Kande's house, they sexually assaulted his mother-in-law, though he and his wife Bindu escaped unharmed. Then last May, they attacked again, and after the second attack, Kandi told his wife, Bindu, that extremists were not going to give up and that they should remain vigilant in their prayers. On June 7th, the mob came back to Kandi, and he said, I may be killed tonight, he told his wife as they marched him away from his home, but I will never attack these people. I will never give up my faith, and even if I am killed, Kandi's body was then found by the roadside the following morning. And although his wife Bindu must now raise their two children alone, she is determined to honor her husband's final admonition. She won't give up her faith. In the world, you have tribulation. And even with tribulation, Jesus says, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, but my peace and no matter what you may be going through, circumstances in life, you can have God's peace, Christ's peace in your life. In John 16, Jesus said, These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. And no matter what tribulations we're going through or may in the future go through, we can have 
Jesus' peace. Jesus came to give us a peace relationship with God the Father, and he came so that we could have his peace in a world of turmoil. But thirdly, Jesus will come again, and he will establish peace upon earth when he comes again. One of the most quoted Old Testament passages around Christmas time is Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. It's part of the Handel's Messiah, but this is what it says. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. This is a messianic prophetic passage, but it doesn't refer to Jesus Christ's first coming. It's relating to his second coming. At the coming of Jesus Christ, when he comes back, he will sit on the throne of his father, David, and there will be peace when he's ruling. Here's what Jesus said about peace at his first coming in Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 and 36. He said, do not think I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his household. What Jesus is saying is when I come, when he came the first time and he's showing the kingdom of God to the people, they have to make a decision. Are they going to follow the Christ or are they not going to follow the Christ and be against the Christ, be against the Messiah? He came to separate families for Christ or against Christ. But when Jesus Christ comes back, he's going to usher in peace. There will be peace when Jesus reigns in the kingdom he sets up here on earth. The first song we sang tonight was called Joy to the World. Anybody know who wrote it? Isaac Watts wrote this song. And in the last verse, it says, He rules the world with truth and grace. And makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love. This Christmas song, although we sing it every Christmas, it's referring to when Christ Jesus comes back. It's all about his second coming. When Jesus comes back, then what's written in Isaiah chapter 9, he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. It's at the return of Jesus when there will be peace on earth. So during this strange COVID year, I ask you, do you have peace? Do you have peace? On that very first Christmas, an angel of the Lord announced to the shepherds the good news of great joy, which will be for all the people that today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Do you have peace? Do you have peace with God because you have a faith relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you have peace around turbulent times and situations that are all around us? Do you have peace because Jesus says, I give you my peace. In the world you have tribulation, but I give you my peace. And one day he's coming back and he'll usher in a time of peace. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you will not be part of that kingdom. The first verse of Joy to the World says, Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Jesus is coming back as king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. Has your heart prepared room for Jesus? Have you received him as your Savior, as your Lord? A long time ago, after high school, I'll tell you it's a long time ago, 
I went to a college called Florida Bible College. And at Florida Bible College, I went there one year, then I transferred to Moody Bible Institute where I met Cheryl. And then we got married and the rest is history. But the year I was at Florida Bible College, uh, they were strong in teaching you how to present the gospel. And they gave me this little illustration, I'll never forget it. It's real simple. It takes two hands. He says, let this hand, your right hand, represent God. Let your left hand represent you, people, man. God created man so we could have, he could have a relationship with mankind. But all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, sin entered into the world. And because sin entered into the world, death entered the world also because of sin. And so we were taught to say, take your wallet out, use that to represent sin. After all, money is the root of all sorts of evil, right? So we'll let the wallet represent sin. All of us have sin. God's holy. We are not holy. We have sin. And sin separates from us from God. And the wages of sin is going to be death, separation from God for all eternity. And so God did what we couldn't do. Now, we try to get rid of the sin. We think if we go to church, we'll get rid of the sin. If I pray enough, I'll get rid of the sin. If I get baptized, I'll get rid of the sin. If I'm good to my neighbors and to my spouse and my family, I'll get rid of this sin. But the Bible says there is no work you can do to remove this sin. It's not by works of righteousness which you do, but it's according to his mercy he saved you. We're stuck with sin, and we can't get rid of it. So God did what we couldn't do. He sent his son. God became man. God the Son, Jesus, became man. He lived that perfect life. He lived the perfect life so that he could go to the cross one day for the purpose of paying the penalty for that sin. Jesus has already died on the cross, paid the penalty for sin, but we still have it. And we cannot enter into the kingdom of God. We can't enter into heaven because of our sin. The vehicle by which this sin is removed is placing your faith in Jesus Christ. When you place your faith in Jesus Christ, that sin is gone. God now sees you as righteous because of Jesus. So I ask you, do you have peace with God? Have you received Jesus Christ as your Savior having your sin removed, being given Christ's righteousness, do you have peace with God? Would you join me in prayer? Father, I don't know if every person in this room is in a peace relationship with God the Father. I don't know if everybody in this room has received Jesus Christ as their Savior. It's not complicated. But Lord, perhaps there's somebody sitting here tonight or watching online that has not received Jesus, does not have his peace, is not in a peace relationship with you, Father God. And so, Lord, I want to extend the invitation to this congregation and for those who are watching. If you would like to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, the good news of great joy is that a Savior has come. And so if you'd like to invite the Lord Jesus to be your Savior, simply pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I admit I am a sinner, but I believe. I believe that you, Jesus, went to the cross. You paid the penalty of my sin. And this evening, by faith, I'm receiving you, Jesus, as my Savior. Cleanse me. Forgive me. Make me one of God's children. I ask this in your name. And for everyone who's prayed that prayer, meaning it from their hearts, the Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 12, but as many as received him, received Jesus, 
to them, God gave the right to be called children of God to those that believe in his name. Lord, we don't deserve salvation, but we are eternally grateful that you, Lord Jesus, came to die in our place so that we could have life. Saying thank you seems so insignificant, but we worship you this evening for coming to save us. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. As a believer in Jesus Christ, there's something that we do to remember all that Christ Jesus has done for us. It's called the Lord's Table. The Lord's Table is a, well, it's a, an institution that's been uh, given to us by Jesus Christ himself the night before he went to the cross. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul wrote, I'm trying to find it, he wrote these words, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And then Paul says that we ought to take this in a worthy manner. What that means is if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, then the bread and the cup is for you. It's a way that you enter into a special fellowship with God himself with Jesus Christ. We call it communion. If you haven't received Jesus Christ, it's just a little piece of bread and a little bit of grape juice. It really has no meaning unless you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. And so we ask that you would take both the cups, the bread and the juice, back to your seat. I'll read a little bit more scripture, and then we'll partake together. And so as the music's being played, Make your way, if you would like to have the Lord's table tonight, and bring it back to your seat.
In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26, beginning in verse 26. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Let's do that together. Take, eat, this is my body. Then Matthew writes, and when he had taken a cup and he gave thanks for it, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. And Jesus says, let's drink from it, all of us. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you so much for loving us that you, you sent your own son to this earth for the purpose of dying so we could have life, eternal life. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that you're willing to come and you're willing to suffer and die on a cross. And it was your blood that was paying for our sin. And giving us an opportunity to have forgiveness of sins. So we give you thanks. Thanks for that love. Thanks for that grace and mercy. But most of all, thanks for the gift of Jesus. And it's in his name I pray. Amen. You'll notice that in front of you in the seats, there's a little place on the rack for you to put your cups. And we'd like you to do that as we stand for our closing song. Lord, 
thy birth, Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we, we are so marveled just, and just at the amazing gift of your coming. Jesus, and just, and just we thank you so much that you had us for that amazing gift. And it's the greatest gift that we, that any of us could ask for and the gift that absolutely none of us and deserve. Thank you for it. Bless us as we go and keep us safe. It is in your amazing name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for worshiping with us, and you all are dismissed.